So we have this story uh, from SF Gate. Car break-ins in San Francisco are rampant. Will a one hundred thousand dollar reward huh. help? You know what I love about this? Let me let me read. They say on Tuesday morning, Mayor London Breed announced a new privately funded reward of up to one hundred thousand dollars, leading to the arrest and conviction of individuals involved in organized crime rings, which the mayor's office says fuels automobile burglaries. The reward is funded by private by private donors in the hospitality and tourism industry. Wow! Per a press release. The mayor's office did not immediately return a request for more information about these private donors. So um, San Francisco has become this nightmare dystopia of failed policy, oligarchs funding uh, reward bounties. I have to I have to imagine the hundred thousand dollars could just go to like, I don't know, hiring police. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is a disturbing trend. It's also a rise of private security in San Francisco has been very prominent. We're in a huge crisis of morale with the police that's been there ever since last summer. Um, and it's resulting in greater homicides and greater crime overall. And, you know, one of the interesting questions I had when I was working on San Francisco was because so much of what is justified in San Francisco in terms of open air drug use, public defecation, public camping, these things are defended as ways of not blaming the victim, you know, helping the victim. So one question is, why would then do progressive support policies that end up creating so many more victims? And the answer, it turns out, is that progressives are really focused on saving the victims of the system. They're not. So this is why, you know, 30 times more African-Americans are killed by civilians than by police officers. Wow. So why the disproportionate attention on police killings? Because those are killings by people that are perceived as the system. So progressive, you know, the word progressive really was a way to both change move away from the word liberal, which was demonized in the late 1980s. It was also, though, um, a way to kind of unite both the radical left and more moderate liberals. But one of the things that it inherited is this idea that really the only, you know, that the system itself is evil and corrupt and that we should only care and make a big deal out of the victims of that system. And so you just see all these efforts to basically do anything other than do what needs to be done, which is restore confidence in our in the institutions of civilization in the institutions of the so-called system you i guess uh, i don't know if well i'll just ask you used to be i guess a lefty leftist or liberal how would you describe yourself yeah uh, i would have described myself as radical left uh, certainly wow, in the 90s right yeah. um Perfect. i worked on and now uh, you're now you're far right of course <laughs> <laughs> i'm here aren't i yeah, yeah. Um, i yeah, I, I worked on um, uh, environmental causes, climate change. I worked on, you know, criminal justice issues in the, in the 1990s. There's some people in the comment section saying that you are connected to Soros, George Soros. Is I that was, true? Yeah, I worked for George Soros's uh, funded organizations, but also his foundation itself, the Open Society Institute. How was I, that? Was it impactful for your kind of political ideology? Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I'm getting a lot of comments about that in the yeah. comment section. Yeah, so... Well, so, you know, we have to remember, you know, you're coming out in the 19, late 80s and 1990s, we're coming out of a big war on drugs and a widely held view that we had overreacted to things like crack and that what we should have been doing is drug treatment, is mandating rehab rather than sending guys off to the prisons for decades. And that's still mostly a view I hold. There was also other things going on. There was liberalization of opioid pharmaceuticals because it was viewed as we were under treating pain. And then we were also promoting the decriminalization of marijuana, which we viewed as a, as a relatively benign uh, drug, particularly in comparison to alcohol and cigarettes. And then also we were advocating for providing clean needles to addicts because it would wait to stop HIV AIDS transmissions. When I got out of that work around the year 2000, my understanding was that we were seeking to make drug rehabilitation, including work, including compliant, you know, taking your psychiatric meds, doing what you need to do to live a healthy life. My understanding was that we were going to continue to mandate those things as an alternative to prison. What ended up happening, not in a single law, but in a set of laws and ballot initiatives, is that we basically just said, no, you can. We've decriminalized stealing nine hundred fifty dollars worth of items from Walgreens. We've decriminalized three grams of hard drugs. That was in the same ballot initiative. I voted for it. Sixty-two percent of Californians voted for it. Prop forty-seven in the year twenty fourteen. But you put those two things together: decriminalizing three grams of fentanyl and meth, and stealing nine hundred fifty dollars worth of items, and you get 
yes, organized crime, but crimes that are being committed to feed people's addictions. You know, one of the things that really bugged me, and I mentioned this the other day, but I talk about it a lot. I hear it all the time from the progressives. There are more empty houses than homeless people. Having actually worked with uh, homeless uh, shelters, more than one, uh, you learn a lot about why people are homeless. And it's not this fancy, this fantasy idea of people being like, pardon me, sir, I'm desperate for a place to live. It's actually people who are like, get away from me. I want to be homeless. And they're drinking. And you try and you try and be nice, respectful. You try to help people. But a lot of them, you know, outside of mental illness, there are people who are literally like, don't come near me or else. Yeah, yeah so, you got it. I mean, basically what happens is in the 1980s, you see multiple things going on. But basically you have a crack epidemic, which is really crack and alcohol. Those are the two drugs that would get paired a lot resulting in homelessness, meaning that people would be um, they would quit their jobs and dedicate their day hours to their addictions. They would then disaffiliate. This is the academic word disaffiliation. They would basically become alienated from friends and family who they had stolen from or borrowed money from. And finally, friends and family are like, you got to leave. They're kicking you out. So you basically that is how people became homeless. There was also then deinstitutionalization of our psychiatric hospitals. A lot of those folks were dumped on the streets. So that was what was going on in the 80s. The radical left, really working with liberals, um, basically said these people, the problem with these folks is that they don't have housing. And yeah. there was always a move for socialized housing and, and, and basically free public housing. So they literally invented this propaganda word. There's no other way to say it. Homelessness itself is a propaganda word designed to trick your brain into putting people with totally different problems in the same category, right. including people with schizophrenia, people with a heroin problem, and the proverbial mother escaping an abusive husband. The mother escaping the abusive husband who doesn't have a drug, drug or alcohol problem and is not mentally ill, we do a great job of helping that woman. There's, that's not a problem, okay? The, the person with schizophrenia and the person with, with an addiction, those folks on the street, that's a huge problem, not just, both for them, it's immoral the way we treat them, but also it's, it degrades the fabric of a city. Do you, you think Do you think living in San Francisco led to kind of a political transition for you? And are there any kind of policies you advocated for under the kind of Soros uh, that were influence that you kind of regret now? Great question. So, I mean, one thing is there's, certain, there's certainly, <laughs> I have become more conservative around drugs and alcohol. Um, I still support the decriminalization of marijuana, but I would like to see it more heavily regulated. I still support alcohol being legal, but I, I think amount, I actually come to see things like not being able to buy it at the grocery store, not being able to buy it on Sunday. Things that restrict uh, uh, consumption, I think, is, is good. Um, you know, psychedelics, I worry that we're just, just diving headlong into basically decriminalizing psychedelics without any thought about what the implications of that are. You know, I, when in the 90s, I still remember very vividly being in progressive nonprofits. It was Global Exchange in San Francisco, Brainforce Action Network. We all hung out together. And the homeless advocates struck me as, it just struck me as bizarre. Because it all, I always knew, just because I was pretty street savvy, even in my 20s, because I had done a fair amount of just traveling and I talked to people. I just knew that these folks were addicts and that they were had mental illness. And so this sort of, the kind of, emotional defense of the right of these people to sleep on the sidewalks, I always sort of viewed as bizarre. Like it never made it's, any it's sense to me. Still to this day, you'll see progressives, high profile YouTubers posting things like that's proof of the, of the you know, yeah. the dysfunctional nature of capitalism. And I'm, and I'm yeah. like, someone saying they don't want to be in a building is not anything to do with capitalism at all. Well, it's sad too. I mean, they're, these are often what they're, they're defending the right of psychotic of people in psychotic states, whether from underlying schizophrenia or from heavy meth use, it always manifests the same way. Defending, me, you know, we don't, we don't let grandma with dementia and Alzheimer's live on the street. Well, so well, why do we do that with people in a psychotic state? Well, let's take their argument where they say there are more empty houses than homeless people. Do we just take a, you know, 30 year old schizophrenic man, put him in a house and say, have a nice day. Huh. What do you think would happen to that person in that house? If you just put, they have no food, they have, how are they going to afford utilities? How are they going to maintain the building? 
Well, what's we, going to happen to it? Well, we know. I mean, we've actually been doing an ongoing experiments on this question. And then we had a big one during COVID because we had to because they reduced the shelter population and they, put people in hotels. Mm -hmm. The hotel, first of all, a lot of people died because there wasn't another user with them to revive them with Narcan after nice. they overdosed. Mm. It's multifactorial, obviously. So there's also we're also dealing with a fentanyl epidemic, which is um, uh, incredibly deadly. So first that happened. I mean, the propaganda has been, and this is the propaganda coming from the big foundations, Rockefeller, but it also comes from Malcolm Gladwell at the New Yorker, and it also came from George W. Bush in the in the in the early two thousands, which was just give people housing. That's the cure. The evidence was never there for any right. of it. Um, in fact, it doesn't. It, it, over Harvard just published a major study on this over a twelve year period. Those folks do not retain their housing any better than anybody else does, but it doesn't do anything to address the underlying causes of homelessness, which are mostly addiction, untreated mental yeah. illness. There's a lot of political commentators that directly point the finger at individuals like George Soros when they got involved in local politics, appointing DAs and implementing a lot of these policies. What's your kind of train of thought with his involvement with the, the things that he called for, that he paid for, that he kind of caused in major cities? Yeah, I mean, so George Soros, his orientation is around, um, I would call him a left libertarian. And that is a that is the cat that is left libertarian would encompass kind of the anarchists that the anarchists that took over Seattle, for example, which is something I discuss in the book. But it also includes people like Soros. I, I quote the person who worked for Soros for a long time, somebody that I, I knew pretty well, I've known for almost 25 years. And he said, you know, he goes, George's view is that people should, if people want something, they should have access to it, you know? And so it's a kind of, that's a kind of libertarian mentality. You want heroin or fentanyl? Well, you should be able to buy it. Like, why should we restrict your freedom? So that's part of it. But then there's the, the more liberal or the more left part is also this idea, well, those people are probably victims too. Mm -hmm. So there's two separate conceptual universes that are being married in this. So it kind of goes, you want access to fentanyl and you're a victim. And therefore we should give you whatever you want, not just the needles, but a place to sleep and we should give you medical care, but we shouldn't do anything to persuade you not to use fentanyl or meth, much less like enforce laws against you because that would be immoral because you're a victim. Yeah. That's a lot, the basic picture. A lot of the DAs in a lot of very important places are directly backed by him. He gives a lot of money. And this buys him a lot of influence, like in Loudoun County, mm -hmm. uh, a county not far away from us, where a big story broke that some like people minute, are, literally. Yeah, some people are being censored a few days ago. The, the prosecutor tried to give the father, who was the victim in this, in this case, a you know, prison sentence for showing up at a school board meeting and raising concerns about this. And, and this prosecutor had uh, $860,000 given to him by a Soros pack. Uh, his name is Buta Benjari. Uh, and, and he's literally implementing policy on the local level in such a way where it's extremely political, extremely divisive. A lot of times very hardened criminals get, get off and a lot of people for political crimes go to jail for very hard sentences. So uh, that's why I was kind of hinting and I kind of wanted to talk to you about it because you seem to have kind of experience in it. But, but a lot of people are pointing to this as some of the main reasons why there's such urban decay happening all over the United States. And that's why I kind of want yeah, to get feedback uh, on it. Soros has a lot to answer for. He's supporting these, he's supporting you know progressive DAs who have just clearly gone too far in into victimology. I think he's just deeply out of touch. He's very old at this point. I don't think he has, you know, a lot of these guys are like, they don't, you know, I say to, this is the adjective, the problem and part of the problem in California is, you know, I'll, I'll describe, I would describe what I'm working on to people that I knew and they go, yeah, well, that's why I don't go downtown. Hmm. And you're kind of like, yeah, but aren't we like, uh, what about like the whole thing about how we're a kind of a single community in a single country or a single city or have some whatever happened to like brotherly love or, you know, you are your brother's keeper. I mean, that's all gone. It's just kind of like, or I once after the recall failed against the current governor, I tweeted out something that was like, this is a problem because we've got this human rights crisis on the streets. And somebody responded by putting a picture of them in their just kind of douchey little bicycle shorts on a bicycle, like taking a selfie of them with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background being like, but look at how beautiful it is. I and I was like, well, yeah, my house is nice, too. But like, 
712 people died unnecessarily last year on the streets of San Francisco out of your supposed compassion. So mm. pull your head out of your ass and let's do something about this as opposed to just being like, I don't go downtown. When yeah. I went to Sweden several years ago, you know, Donald Trump goes on TV, says last night in Sweden, and then created this huge thing. So I was like, I'll go there. We went to a place called Rinkeby. Oh, yeah. Initially, everything was like fine. We went to Rosengard and they were like, it's dangerous, but it was fine. In Rinkeby, in the middle of the day at lunchtime, it was crowded. We actually started getting threats. People were yelling at us and the police told us we should probably leave. The cop said to me, look, if, if these people start throwing stones, like we can't protect you. And then I was like, okay, so we'll go. Cause we, we were like, we, we had cameras. And so they were yelling stuff as like express in. They thought we were a, a news outlet from Sweden. Mm. Cause we, we had a small camera. One of the cameras we use here actually the same kind. And so one of these other journalists said, oh, he's exaggerating. It's not dangerous. I'll prove it. I'll go there. And so this woman shows up there, goes, n does not go into the center shopping area of Rinkeby where, where we were, stands outside the arches in the middle of the night, wearing a full coat that covered her hands. You couldn't see the color of her skin. You couldn't see anything about her with her back to the entrance and said, see, look, I'm here in the middle of the night. <laughs> And, and it's just, that's, that's how the media manipulates and plays these dirty games to say, there's no problem here, nothing to see here. The reality was, yes, a small blonde woman at two in the morning when no one's around, wearing a coat covering every inch of her body and not actually going in, will make a lot of people think there's no problem because people assume the middle of the night's when it's dangerous. No, the middle of the day is when it was dangerous, when there was a hundred plus people there. And they didn't like the, the press and they took issue with people based on their skin color. So they'll, 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 they'll sweep it under the rug using assumptions, tropes, and manipulation. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've seen that. Uh, there's basically been an effort to deny that crime has been increasing in California over the last 10 or 20 years. We've seen a huge decline in arrests uh, per reports for shoplifting. And so one of the things they'll say is we'll say, well, we were seeing you know, fewer arrests. Well, that doesn't mean there's less crime. Look, we, we do got to, I got one more question for you on the subject um, real quick. Have murders in San Francisco gone up or down? They've gone up over the you last know, two years, certainly since the George Floyd protests. Do you want to know why that's so substantial? Murder rates around the world have been going down for one reason. And do you know what it is? If you had to guess, why would murder rates be going down for, for the past, uh, uh, I believe it's about the past 13 or so years until now? Well, I mean, in the book I describe, um, a variety of factors, but I mean, the two big ones I looked at were better but, but, policing and um, rising legitimacy. The answer is actually cell phones. The crimes are still being committed, but people have the ability to call EMS within seconds, as opposed to before the era of the ubiquitous smartphone, people would, say, would see an emergency and then run to find a phone, which dramatically increased response time. Mm. So I actually learned this when I was in uh, Sweden. They were what they were saying was the, the progressives were trying to say, oh, no, look, you know, like even though uh, crime is going up, it's not that much, except when you look at homicide rates in other countries, they were all in a downward trend. And what we ended up discovering was since cell phones became something everyone had when a, when a, when a lethal crime was committed or, or which which a, a crime that could be potentially lethal, people immediately called the police. The ambulance got there within minutes. This decreases the amount of murders but increases the amount of attempted murders or aggravated crimes. Hmm. So in the United States, we saw, we've seen murders going down in a lot of ways. For places where murders are going up, that's in spite of the fact that people now have the opportunity to call emergency services, which is exacerbated by the fact when you defund the police and now calling gets you nothing. So now we start seeing it go back up. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think there's, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated um, area. There's, um, I tend to side with, two basic strands of research, one showing that declining belief in the legitimacy of the government and the system corresponds with increasing, hor increasing homicides. This is all based on this work from a book called American Homicide by Randolph Roth. But then I also, um, you know, the growing consensus among a lot of criminologists is that the rise in homicides after Ferguson in 2015 and then after the George Floyd uh, killing and the, the Black Lives Matter protests last summer was due to basically what we call the Ferguson effect, which is the emboldenment of criminals out of de declining legitimacy, but also the pulling back of police from 
the kind of street, you know, walking the streets, interacting with, with the folks, including the folks that are more likely to commit homicide. Thanks for checking out this segment from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to watch live, you can check out this channel Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel. And if you want more unfiltered and uncensored content with all of these guests, go to TimCast.com and become a member. All of these guests you know and love in exclusive segments on our website where we are unrestricted in what we talk about. So you'll definitely not want to miss it. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you all next time.